Before we begin, I did just want to start by acknowledging that we meet today on the beautiful lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and recognise their historical and continuing role in caring for the lands and waterways that sustain us all. Uh, I've had the good fortune of working alongside some fantastic young First Nations campaigners um, from an organisation called Common Ground that I highly recommend everyone check out. And they always highlight that when we acknowledge country, we so very rarely actually acknowledge the country that we're standing on. So um, given that we're here today to talk about economic issues, I just want to acknowledge the impact that our economy has had on these lands and the contributions that it has made to our changing climate, which has undergone sustainable cycles for at least 65,000 years of stewardship by the First Peoples of this place. We know that we need to centre the knowledges of our First Nations communities in how we respond to, adapt and above all else mitigate the effects of a rapidly changing climate whose impacts have already ravaged these lands. I want to acknowledge as well that this has always been a place of meeting, of discussion and debate and it's in that spirit that we meet here today. I want to pay my respects to Elders past and present and move forward in the understanding and the spirit of solidarity with First Nations of this country and extend our sincerest hopes that the voice, which has been progressed um, so fantastically under the current government, continues as one that both acknowledges the divisive past, but also one that brings us together and gives us all a voice and a role in shaping our collective future. I want to end by acknowledging that these are lands which were stolen, never ceded, and that this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Friends, comrades, it's so great to have you all here today for this exciting discussion. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, my name's Shirley Jackson, um, and I'm the director of the Centre for New Industry here at Per Capita, an applied research centre which is dedicated to economic diversification, decarbonisation and democratisation. Um, here at Per Capita, we're interested in the big ideas, and we're committed to moving beyond the business-as-usual approach to politics um, which is why we're so happy to have this talk today on monopsony, monopolies and uncompetitive markets. Now, this is a topic that's very close to my own heart. As a huge Jane Robinson fanboy, uh, which my colleagues can attest, I have a photo and a quote from her excellent book, uh, Economic Philosophy, that hangs above my computer at work, um, which is, the solutions offered by economists are no less delusory than the, those of the theologians that we have displaced. All the same, we must not abandon the hope that economics can make an advance towards science or the faith that enlightenment is not useless. It is necessary to clear the decaying remnants of obsolete metaphysics out of the way before we can go forward. The first essential for economists arguing amongst themselves is to try very seriously, as Professor Popper says that natural scientists do, to avoid talking at cross purposes and addressing the world regarding their own doctrines aright, to combat, not foster the ideology which pretends that values which can be measured in terms of money are the only ones that ought to matter. So aside from writing excellent, if acerbically quotable lines about the study and nature of economics as a discipline, uh, Professor Robinson is also essential reading for anyone who wants to understand the way that power operates um, within, within markets and their power to distort them, a task that she outlines in her seminal work, The Economics of Imperfect Competition, where she outlines her theory of monopsony and the impacts that it has on effective and efficient operation of markets. Now, I won't go on to say any more about the topic because we have someone here who is grossly more qualified to talk about it than I am. Uh, Professor Andrew Lee is the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury in the Albanese Labor Government and Federal, federal Member for FENA in the ACT. Prior to being elected in 2010, Andrew was a Professor of Economics at the ANU, where he wrote widely across a range of scholarly topics, including wealth and income inequality, behavioural economics, unemployment, and essential to our discussion today, markets and competition. He's also probably the most prolific author in government at the moment, uh, and his books include Disconnected, Battlers and Billionaires, The Story of Inequality in Australia, The Economics of Just About Everything, The Luck of Politics, Choosing openness while global engagement is best for Australia, random Easters, uh, innovation and equality, how to create a future that is more Star Trek than Terminator, which is one of my favourites. Uh, reconnected, a community builder's handbook. Uh, what's the worst that could happen? Existential risk and extreme politics and fair game, lessons from sport for a fairer society and a stronger economy, which I, I'm afraid I haven't read yet, but I look forward to reading. Uh, we're so pleased to have Andrew here with us today and please join me in welcoming him here. Well, thanks, Shelley, for a uh, most generous. Should I? 
There we go. Try that again. Thank you, Shirley, for a most uh, generous introduction. Uh, and can I acknowledge the Wurundjeri, uh, Woi Warring and Bunrong Bun Warring peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Pay my respects to elders, extend that respect to other First Nations people present, uh, and commit myself as a member of the Albanese government to the implementation in full of the Uluru Statement of the Heart. Uh, special uh, thanks to Per Capita and to Morris Blackburn for hosting today's event uh, and for the very generous pre-event hospitality. The song 16 Tons was written by Merle Travis in 1946. It's been covered many times, most famously by Johnny Cash. It's about a real group of coal miners who lived and worked in a company town in Mullenberg County, Kentucky. And the chorus goes, you load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St Peter, don't you call me, because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. And to Mel Travis, these lines were personal. The first two lines came from his brother. The last two lines came from his father. Both had experienced what it was like to work all day and get paid not in cash, but in script, redeemable only at the company store. Folk music fans might also be familiar with Pete Seeger's Homestead Strikes song, written about another company town. Homestead, Pennsylvania was a company town built in the 1880s to supply workers to Andrew Carnegie's steel mills. The men worked in the foundries and raised their families in the purpose-built town. They made railway lines and bridges and steel for the Empire State Building. A contract between the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers Union and Carnegie Steel was due to expire on the 1st of July 1892. Carnegie gave his operations manager permission to break the union before the contract ended. Wages were cut and workers were locked out of the plant. They went on strike and 3,800 were fired the following day. On the 6th of July, 1892, the steel workers fought for control of the factory in the town against strike breakers shipped in under cover of night by Carnegie's managers. In a 12 hour gun battle and its aftermath, three strike breakers and seven workers died. Comedy towns peaked around the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, uh, there was a number of successes and many failures to the capitalist class. But it seems such utopian dreams linger even today. In March 2021, Elon Musk announced plans to incorporate the site of a SpaceX rocket manufacturing and launch facility with a city called Starbase. Presumably it's a trial run for SpaceX company towns on Mars. <laughs> the story of the company town here in Australia is a bit different. Here, they were usually established to accommodate workforces in remote places. Roxby Downs, Mount Beauty and Bogong Village, Useless Loop on the West Australian coast, owned by Japan's Mitsui Group. And in case you're wondering, the town's name came from a French explorer who disliked the harbour, not from an economist analysing the way money typically flows around a company town. <laughs> And then there's the Australian company towns that operate with a fly-in, fly-out workforce, such as Newman or Barrow Island. While company towns have declined, concerns about employer market power have been gaining ground. Some see wannabe modern company towns in situations where a single employer dominates a large portion of the labour force. This is where monopoly and monopsony meet. The trailblazing Cambridge economist Joan Robinson who should have been the first woman to win the Nobel Prize is in, in economics, is credited with popularising the term monopsony. Building on Adam Smith's concerns over monopoly, Robinson challenged accepted wisdom in her male-dominated profession by rejecting the idea of perfect markets. And that meant contradicting the formidable Alfred Marshall, who'd long dominated economics at Cambridge. He argued supply and demand could meet in perfect equilibrium where workers were paid precisely the value of their contribution to production. This, Marshall said, gave consumers the upper hand because companies had to compete on price and quantity in a competitive market. The problem was Marshall's conviction that monopoly was a passing flaw that would correct itself over time. Joan Robinson disagreed. 
In 1933, at the age of 30, she published her landmark book, The Economics of Imperfect Competition. Monopoly, she argued, didn't have an on-off switch, and truly competitive markets were rare. In a monopoly, the consumer pays the price set by the supplier. In a monopsony, the supplier accepts the price set by the buyer. Monopolies hurt consumers, monopsonies hurt suppliers. In the labour market, workers are suppliers. The service they supply is their labour. Now, as citizens, we don't typically think of ourselves as suppliers, but in the labour market, that's exactly what we are. Joan Robinson argued that monopsony was endemic in the labour market, and employers were using it to keep wages low. If there's a small number of employers competing for workers, those workers have fewer outside options. Their bargaining power is limited. Therefore, employers have the power to set lower wages. In the extreme case, think of the plight of the employees in Mullenberg or Homestead or those other one-company towns. Workers benefit when there's more employers in the labour market. More employment options means greater bargaining power. Workers can swap jobs and move on to better pay and conditions with another employer. And I'll discuss in just a moment how important that is in the Australian context. Joan Robinson passed away in 1983 and monopsony fell out of favour in many, with many economists in the ensuing decades. But in recent years, Robinson and monopsony have made a return to economics, big time. Last year, the Journal of Human Resources released a special issue focused on monopsony in the labour market. It was an acknowledgement of the growing focus on market power in economic literature more broadly. As the editors of the special issue argued, the idea that firms have some market power in wage setting has been slow to gain acceptance in economics. Indeed, until relatively recently, the textbooks viewed monopsony power as either a theoretical curiosum or a concept limited to a handful of company towns in the past. This view is changing rapidly driven by a combination of theoretical innovations, empirical findings, dramatic legal cases, and new data sets that make it possible to measure the degree of market power in different ways. The concepts also caught the attention of competition lawyers. Monopsony was cited in a rule, ruling against Apple in the US Supreme Court in 2019, which found, quote, a retailer who is both a monopolist and a monopsonist may be liable to different classes of plaintiffs both to downstream consumers and to upstream suppliers, when a retailer's unlawful conduct affects both the downstream and upstream markets. Think of iPhone users as consumers in a monopoly market. They're likely to pay more for a product because of the seller's market dominance. When the iPhone 15 hits the shelves in September, there's only one company that'll be selling it to you. But you can also think of Apple's app developers as suppliers in a monopsony. They're likely to get less from the product they're selling because Apple has the monopsony on which apps run on its systems. There's a reason that Apple can take a cut of 30% on most in-app purchases because there's only one way of getting an app onto an iPhone. Both suppliers and consumers lose. Monopoly meets monopsony. A report by US House Democrats accused Amazon of using monopsony power in its warehouses to depress wages in local markets. The Democrats described Amazon as acting like a monopsony because of the way it pressured third party suppliers to lower their prices if they wanted to sell products through the behemoths platform. These were the characteristics of a monopsony, according to Democrats, because of Amazon's market dominance interaction with suppliers and behaviour in the labour market. Maybe this is the case of a company town gone global. Evidence from the US, UK and Europe has demonstrated that increases in labour market concentration are associated with lower wages. Without market power, economic theory would predict that wages are equal to workers' marginal product of labour, the increase in output as additional labour is used. With market power, an employer can set lower wages, meaning a worker's producing at a higher level 
than they're being paid. Studies of the US and Europe find the impact is larger in rural labour markets, potentially reflecting fewer opportunities and larger employer power outside metropolitan areas. Economists have long noted that people in cities tend to earn more than those in regional areas. My own research finds that when someone moves from a rural area to a major Australian city, their annual income rises by 8%. The economics of monopsony suggests that an important part of the urban wage premium might be explained by greater employer competition in denser labour markets. A recent US paper found that workers may produce 21% more than they earn, suggesting significant monopsony power. In other words, for every $1.21 of value that employees produce, they're paid $1 in wages. While the level of employer concentration appears to be fairly stable over time in the US, the negative relation between concentration and wages has been increasing in magnitude over time. In areas with few employers, those firms are increasingly wielding their power to suppress wages. In Australia, as in many other nations, wage growth has been slow. The average weekly full-time wage in November 2022, the most recently available figures, was $1,808 a week. In 2002 dollars, the average wage in November 2012 was $1,790 a week. In other words, after inflation, Australian workers earned only $18 a week more in November 2022 than they did in November 2012. Fundamental determinants such as productivity and inflation expectations have played a role. But even so, wage growth has been slower than expected. At the same time, the rate at which people move between employers has also fallen. Now forget about what you've heard about the joys of a job for life. Across a career, the biggest wage gains on average come when people switch employers. For a worker who's keen on a pay rise, the best chance is to get a new job or at least a new job offer. And by the way, people who switch, switch jobs won't be hurting their co-workers. When some employees switch jobs, it tends to mean better wages for stayers, as they can leverage their option to switch when negotiating with their employer. So why have job switching rates fallen? And why has wage growth been so slow? Increases in employer concentration and larger impacts of employer concentration on wages could explain both phenomena. A newly researched Treasury working paper by Jonathan Hambor considers whether labour market concentration lowered wage growth pre-COVID. The paper explores the trends in and impact of monopsony power in Australia. Defining the labour market as the intersection of a region and an industry, it uses rich, de-identified tax data to measure concentration in labour markets across the country. The analysis separates Australia into 290 working zones. For example, Canberra, or Kalgoorlie, or Townsville. And 190 industries. For example, coal mining, or residential building construction or life insurance. So for example, it might look at the concentration of employers for grocery stores in Wagga Wagga. Together, the analysis separates Australia into around 25,000 local labour markets per year. And the employment concentration is measured using a herfindahl hirschman index, which ranges from zero for a perfectly competitive market to one for a monopsony employer. Think one company town. Hamber's research reveals that in Australia, wages tend to be lower in more concentrated markets. Within markets where concentration rose, real wage growth over the decade was significantly lower. Now on average, larger firms are more productive. The turnover per employee is likely to be lower at a corner store than a big supermarket. Thanks to more capital, more efficient management systems, and the benefits of scale, large firms tend to be more productive and pay higher wages. But when a labour market is more concentrated, 
or when a firm has a larger share of the employment market, the gap between the value of what a worker produces and the wage they're paid mm -hmm. tends to grow. And that means large firms set lower wages once other factors, such as productivity, are taken into account. While the level of concentration in Australia is lower than in the US, there's substantial variation across markets. Figure two shows the pattern of market concentration across industries and compares that with same industries in the United States. Employer concentration in the Australian labour market is highest in the mining industry, manufacturing, transport, utilities and retail trade. For most of these industries, concentration is higher in the United States. But in the case of mining, employment concentration is slightly higher in Australia. The next figure, figure three, looks at regions across Australia, estimating the average level of employer concentration in cities, regional areas and remote Australia. It shows that employment is twice as concentrated in inner regional areas as it is in major cities. In remote areas, employment concentration is three times as high as in major cities. And that suggests that monopsony power might be a particular problem for those living outside major Australian cities. Now the Treasury analysis looks over time and finds that while labour markets haven't become more concentrated, the negative impact of any given level of concentration on wages has increased. For a given level of concentration, its negative impact on wages has more than doubled compared to the mid-2000s. Because of this, employer market power could be a factor that's influenced the slow growth of wages over the last decade. The greater impact of concentration, according to Jonathan Hamburg, may have lowered wages by around 1% from 2011 to 2015. And that could explain why the share of productivity gains passed through to workers has declined over the last 15 years. The Treasury analysis finds that declining firm entry and declining economic dynamism appear to be important factors contributing to the increased impact of concentration. When firms enter, they tend to compete and poach staff away from existing firms to grow. As such, they generate better outside options for workers. When entry rates are high, people are more likely to switch jobs, and this relationship is driven by people moving from incumbent firms to young firms. So when entry rates are higher, even if markets are still somewhat concentrated, there's more outside options for workers, lessening the effect of concentration on wages. Overall, Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan Hambor's research provides new evidence on monopsony power in Australia, adding to the growing literature on dynamism, competition and market power. We've always known that monopolies hurt the average person. By transferring resources from consumers to shareholders, they make the typical family worse off and worsen inequality. But now we can see another effect. If these monopolies also exert monopsony power, they may drive down wages. Workers may get a smaller pay packet because of monopsony power, and then find that when they try to spend it, they get less for their money because of monopoly power. To double squeeze. Last year, I delivered four major speeches on economic dynamism and competition. I focused on the way in which market concentration has grown. I discussed the decline in the startup rate. I outlined the evidence on markups, the gap between costs and prices, and how markups have grown over time. Those findings are highly relevant at a time when inflation is surging around the world. Bigger markups didn't cause our inflation problems, but they're one of the reasons people are paying more than they should for everyday necessities. Alongside this, I'm pleased to see a growing focus among researchers on issues of market dynamism. In particular, work by the new E61 Institute has highlighted the negative implications of declining dynamism on productivity and therefore on wages. Monopsony power suggests another mechanism through which declining business dynamism 
might have lowered wage growth. Make no mistake, the labour market today is less dynamic than in the past. Treasury estimates the share of workers starting a new job in the previous three months declined from an average of 8.7% in the period from 2002 to 2008 to 7.3% from 2008 to 2019. Monopsony power has weakened workers' outside options and bargaining power, made labour markets less competitive, and therefore lowered workers' wages. A more dynamic and competitive economy will help improve labour market outcomes. So, what's to be done? In the area of monopsony power, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has, in the past, taken on misconduct by firms with regard to their suppliers. In a note prepared for the OECD last year, the competition watchdog concluded, quote, our market studies in a range of sectors demonstrate that buyer's power and the inequality of bargaining power that underlines it creates real risks of potential harm to the effective operation of markets. The Commission pointed to enforcement action under fair trading laws and industry-specific regulation as a check on buyer's powers. However, Australian competition law specifically carves out matters relating to earnings, hours or conditions of employment. So I've been unable to identify instances in which the competition watchdog has taken enforcement action against firms engaged in labour market collusion. Now that contrasts with the United States, where Assistant Attorney General, uh, General Jonathan Cantor recently told a Senate committee hearing one area we've been particularly active is prosecution of criminal conspiracies among employers. Labor market competition is essential to a properly functioning market-based economy. Free market competition for workers can mean the difference between saving for a home, sending kids to college, and leaving a toxic workplace, or being forced to stay. It also means free market competition for entrepreneurs, small business owners, and honest businesses of all kinds, who compete to attract and retain talented workers. He went on to say, criminal conspiracies in labour markets include wage fixing and allocation agreements that limit work at mo worker mobility or suppress wages. Agreements by employers to restrict labour market competition is entitled to no special treatment under the US antitrust laws. We'll continue to prosecute collusion in labour markets that serves no other purpose than to cheat workers of competitive wages, benefits and other terms of employment. In the last two years, the Antitrust Division has brought six criminal cases. Labor market collusion, Jonathan says, is a felony under the Sherman Act. Employees are no less, no less entitled to the protections of the Sherman Act than are consumers. Anti-competitive practices in the labor market are equally pernicious and are treated the same as anti-competitive practices in markets for goods and services. Now, a particular concern in the labour market are non-compete and no-poach clauses. On one estimate, 18% of US workers are currently subject to a non-compete clause, and 38% have been subject to one at some point in their career. Non-compete clauses aren't restricted to high-wage jobs. In the US, Non-compete clauses bind 11% of landscapers, 12% of construction workers, 18% of installers, 19% of personal care workers. Non-compete clauses make it harder for workers to shift jobs. And even in US states where non-compete agreements are unenforceable, many workers end up signing contracts containing such clauses. No-poach clauses have a similar effect to non-compete clauses by constraining employers from engaging workers who've recently been employed at a competing outlet. In the 1980s to the 2010s, a group of Silicon Valley companies, including Pixar, Apple, Google, Adobe and Intel, colluded in an agreement to not attempt to hire each other's technology workers. Only a lawsuit from the US Department of Justice finally ended the conspiracy. No poach clauses also turn out to be ubiquitous in franchises. Analyzing US franchise agreements, researchers found that no poach clauses existed in 58% of major franchisors' contracts, 
including those at McDonald's, Burger King, Jiffy Lube and H&R Block. In Australia, I've been unable to find any surveys of the prevalence of non-compete clauses. On no poach clauses, the only evidence comes from an exercise I conducted in 2019, writing to all major Australian franchisors to ask whether their standard franchise agreements including, included a no poach clause. Among them, McDonald's, Baker's Delight and Domino's wrote back to me to say that their standard clauses prevent franchisees from hiring workers at other stores. For example, McDonald's told me, told me that each franchise store in Australia must sign a contract that says, neither licensee nor principal shall employ or seek to employ any person who is at the time employed by McDonald's or by licensor or by any of the subsidiaries or associated or related companies of McDonald's or licensor or any person who is at the time operating McDonald's record, re restaurant or otherwise induce or attempt to induce directly or indirectly such person to leave employment. Most McDonald's workers would have no idea about this clause, which directly affects their ability to get a better paying job at another McDonald's store. Now to their credit, at least these three retailers, uh, McDonald's, uh, Baker's Delight and Domino's replied. Many of the large franchise chains simply ignored my request. Unlike the US, there's no requirement for their franchise contracts to be publicly lodged. So we can't know the full extent to which other franchise chains are reducing the competition for workers. What can policymakers do? Well, in the US, the Federal Trade Commission has concluded that scrapping non-compete clauses could boost worker earnings by almost 300 billion US dollars and close racial and gender gaps by up to 9%. Accordingly, the Federal Trade Commission has now proposed a total ban on non-competes across the US economy. Announcing the proposal, Federal Trade Commissioner Chair Lena Khan said, the freedom to change jobs is core to economic liberty and a competitive, thriving economy. Non-competes block workers from freely switching jobs, depriving them of higher wages and better working conditions, and depriving businesses of a talent pool they need to build and expand. And the comment period on the proposed ban runs until the 20th of March. Here in Australia, non-compete clauses are only enforceable if they can be shown to reasonably protect a legitimate business interest. In judging such cases, court, courts may consider the duration, geographic area and industry reach of the non-compete clause. On this basis, some commentators have argued that the deterrent effect of Australian non-compete clauses on worker mobility is limited. But that ignores the findings from US research that even in states such as California, where non-compete clauses are unenforceable, they still exert an effect. There's a number of reasons for this, including workers not being perfectly aware of all their legal rights and the financial risk to an employee of facing off against their former employer in court. As one Australian website advises employers, it's easy to insert a non-compete clause into an employment contract. Even if it might turn out to be unenforceable, why wouldn't a rational employer try to block competitors? Given the growing, growing body of evidence about the way that non-compete clauses hamper job mobility and wage growth, I've asked the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and Treasury for advice on the competitive impacts of non-compete clauses and any action the Australian government should take in response. Last year, I introduced into Parliament a ban on unfair contract terms, and the bill subsequently passed into law. As the ban only applies to consumer and small business contracts, which don't include employment contracts, this new provision likely does not apply to non-compete clauses. But you could argue that the principle still holds. Why should we ban unfair contract terms when it comes to a big business contracting with a small business, yet allow unfair contract terms when it comes to a big business contracting with an individual employee? As to the no poach clauses and franchise agreements, they couldn't be struck down as an unfair contract term. And that's because the disadvantage is to the employee, who isn't a party to the franchise agreement. But at a minimum, it would be useful to know more about the prevalence of these clauses. I encourage Australia's large franchisors to publicly disclose whether their standard agreements 
contain no poach clauses? And if so, to justify why they're in the public interest. Unions also have a critical role to play in curbing monopsony power. In both the US and Australia, the impact of market concentration on wages is smaller when union membership rates are higher. Yet over recent decades, the share of Australian workers who are union members has steadily declined, dropping from 41% in 1992 to 12.5% in 2002. Not since Federation has the Australian unionisation rate been as low as it is today. Deunionisation isn't the primary reason for a decade of wage stagnation. But at a time when the market power of employers is growing, declining union membership risks tilting the playing field further away from workers. As the chant goes, the workers, united, will never be defeated. But in the modern era, employers are increasingly united, while workers are more fragmented than, any, than at any other time in the past 120 years. Providing employees with more opportunities to collectively bargain for better paying conditions would be a useful check on monopsony power. So, to conclude. Two young fish are swimming along one day when they meet an older fish. As they pass, the older fish happily greets them with, hey guys, how's the water? As the older fish swims off, one of the younger fish turns to the other and says, what the heck is water? To many Australian workers, monopsony is the water we swim in every day. Yet, yes, yet unless a wise fish like Johnny Cash or Joan Robinson points it out, it's easy to miss the pernicious impact that monopsony power has on the economy. In this talk, I've outlined some of the facts about monopsony power in Australia. Concentrated labour markets are a particular problem in Australian regions. While labour markets in Australia haven't become more concentrated over time, the negative impact of a given level of concentration on wages has increased. For any given level of concentration, its negative impact on wages has more than doubled compared to the mid-2000s. On one estimate, the greater impact of concentration might have lowered wages by around 1% from 2011 to 2015. In turn, that could ex help explain why the share of productivity gains passed through to workers has declined in the past 15 years. Monopsony power is also closely connected with firm entry. In areas with fewer new firms, people are less likely to switch jobs. And we know how crucial job switching is to wage growth. In the US, strong enforcement action has seen a number of prosecutions of cartels that were aiming to suppress wages. That country's competition regulator has also proposed a nationwide ban on non-compete clauses, arguing it'll boost wages and narrow the gender pay gap. While the Australian government hasn't reached a fixed view on whether new action is needed to tackle the impact of market concentration on wages, we're watching those developments closely and seeking advice from the key competition and economic agencies. My focus on monopsony has been a long time coming. It took economists too long to recognise the problem of monopsony power and the way that monopoly and monopsony can be two sides of the same dodgy coin. Sometimes those who have championed workers' rights have been sceptical of competition reforms, seeing them as threatening a race to the bottom on wages. In fact, as Joan Robinson has shown us, Uncompetitive markets don't just hurt consumers, they can hurt workers too. And that's another reason we're working to shape a more dynamic economy, a more productive corporate sector, and a fairer society. Thanks very much. Look forward to your questions.